Give God a hand. Woo. I'm going to invite you to be seated, and I want to thank our worship team for doing an absolutely incredible job today. Amen? Thank you. And, you know, we want to pray as I begin here today, but I want to tell you the thing I believe that we pray about the most is the people that we love. The, the, the top prayer requests that we get here as a church are people saying things like, Pastor, can you pray for my parents? I had a message here. Can you pray for my parents uh, who are going into a nursing home? Can you pray for my brother who has cancer? Can you pray for my kids who are going through job interviews? Can you pray, you know, family members. And so as we begin here today, this is gonna tie together with kind of the theme of my message, but I wanna pray for the people that we love. And I don't know your situation, but I am sure somewhere in your family, in your relationship, there is someone who is in need of prayer this morning. And I may not know their situation, but there is a God who does. And our God is still in the business of touching lives, still in the business of healing people, still in the business of inspiring hope and faith in the lives of people. And so I wanna pray, I wanna pray for the people that we love. Would you bow with me? And God, I wanna pray for whoever is coming to mind among our church family here right now. People who need your physical healing. God, I pray that you would heal the sick this morning. I pray that you would bring hope to the hopeless, that you would bring faith to those people that we have been praying for, that they would come to know you. I pray that, that you would bring faith and draw them to yourself. God, I wanna pray that you would strengthen the weak. Lord, I wanna pray for every parent and child and sibling and relative, in-law that we have in our relationships. And I pray that you would use us as your people, as your messengers, as your ambassadors to minister to people, to be your representatives, God, that we would give feet to these prayers. And God, I wanna pray for this morning this church family. I wanna pray, God, that these words that I speak this morning would really be your words, that it would not be about anything that I could bring or deliver, but it would truly be about the truth of your word and the power of you, the Holy Spirit, at work in this place, touching lives, God. Change our hearts today. Father, I pray you draw us near to yourself, and I wanna pray especially for people who are here today who might not feel at home in church or who are watching this online and aren't used to the Bible and aren't, aren't used to church, but they would discover something so much more than a church today. They would discover a God who loves them. I pray, I, I pray that you would remind us of your love for us today here in this place. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And we are working our way through this series called Postcards from Paul. And I had some people say to me, talk about Paul, because, you know, I know the Bible, but I'm not really that familiar with Paul. And maybe if you're not used to church, you're not used to the Bible, maybe you never heard of Paul. But Paul was an apostle. That's not a word we use in modern lingo too much. Apostle. But in the first century, man, that was a distinct title. That was a big deal. That was a person who was part of Jesus' inner circle. In fact, it means one who was sent by Christ himself. This person, Paul, who at one time was called Saul, experienced Jesus, the resurrected Christ, at a place called the Damascus Road, and he was never the same again. That's the effect that Jesus has on the life of a person. When you truly experience Jesus, you are never the same again. And Paul became an ambassador for Christ like none other. God used him to write 13 books in the New Testament. Here's your theology lesson for today. It's called prophetic agency. The Holy Spirit inspiring human personalities to write scripture. And God used this person, Paul, in a way that he hasn't used anyone else. This person and what he has written in scripture, what God has inspired him to write, defines much of what it means to be a believer in Christ. It defi he defines in his books in the scripture what it means to do church, who we are as the body of Christ. 
how we live, our morality. There's a lot of things that come from what God inspired Paul to write. But during his time here on earth, he had a ministry mainly to a group of people known as the Gentiles. That's another word we don't use a lot in the 21st century. Gentiles. You know what that means? Those other people. You know those other people? They weren't God's people. They were those other people. They were those people that worshiped other gods and lived other ways, had another standard of morality. That was controversial in the first century, but that was Paul's ministry. His ministry was mainly to the Gentiles. You know the huge irony of this? God uses this person, Paul, as he's never used any other person. And yet this was a person with a past. You know what I mean by a past? He didn't have a good track record. In fact, if he would show up here at church before he met Jesus, our security guards probably wouldn't let him in the church. He was a guy who stalked people, Christians. He, he brutalized, imprisoned families. He was party to murder. And yet, this is the guy God used to change the world for Christ. And you know what that shows me? is that no one is out of God's reach. You may have come here today and you have a past. In fact, we all have a past, every one of us. And you may be far from God. You may have some things that you carry around with you, a lot of shame, guilt. I wanna tell you, no one is beyond redemption. No one is beyond God's reach. I thought for many years that I was beyond God's reach. You are never beyond God's reach. This guy had made some mistakes in his life. Maybe you can relate to that. And if you made some mistakes, if you have a past, maybe even you feel uncomfortable here in church today, this message is for you. Paul was not uneducated. He was trained by the greatest teacher of the first century this Yoda type person, this sage of the Jewish people named Gamaliel. You can see it in Acts 5.34, Acts 22.3. He trained Paul. He was educated. But people said, hey, Paul, 2 Corinthians 10, you're unimpressive. When he actually met the guy, you're not really an impressive guy. I don't know if you've ever had anyone say that about you. You're unimpressive. Maybe you feel unimpressive. Maybe you can relate to that. He wasn't Samson. He wasn't strong, like, you know what I'm saying? He wasn't David ready to go out in the battlefield and take on anyone that, you know, came along. This was a different type of a person. But he brought his own unique set of gifts. And I want you to see today that God has given you a unique set of gifts. Do you know that? And God wants to use those gifts because the thing about Paul was that he was willing. Are you really willing to really walk with God and to really serve God? Are you? Are you willing? Can you say willing? Just say that word. Are you really willing to follow God with your whole heart? Because he was unimpressive. He had a past. And yet, God works in and through him in a way that he hasn't worked in and through anyone else. You know, the one thing about Paul was that he didn't just say it, he actually lived it. You know what I'm saying? It it was more than just talking the talk. He actually walked the walk. I've seen a lot of people recently, and even some national, international people, Christians, who do a lot of talking, but they don't do a lot of walking. And we've seen that more and more. Bless you, brother, and hallelujah. Let me share a scripture with you. But you would never know they were believers by the way they treated other people. This person lived the life. Are we really willing to live the life that God has called us to? I mean, that's a a big question this morning. And that's the thing that Paul was willing to do so much so that he was willing to be arrested and imprisoned because of it. And he was arrested and he was imprisoned by his own people, the people of Israel. Spent two years in prison. And then we picked up the message I did a couple of weeks ago where he was being shipped to Rome to stand trial 
on a boat and they hit a storm. And I was saying a couple weeks ago that in life, yes, we're going to have storms. Paul had storms. You and I are going to have storms. The rain is going to fall on the just and the unjust. And he goes through this storm with 276 other people on this boat. And finally, finally, they see a beach. And I want to pick this up. This is in Acts, the 27th chapter. And it says this, the soldiers planned to kill the prisoners to prevent any of them from swimming away and escaping. This is brutality right here. But the centurion, who was the guy who was leading this contingent of military people from Rome, wanted to spare Paul's life and kept them from carrying out their plan. So because of one person, all the other prisoners were saved because of God's man. He ordered those who could not swim to jump overboard first and, or excuse me, those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. And the rest were to get there on planks or on other pieces of the ship. In this way, everyone reached land safely. That's incredible. They had been driven by the wind 600 miles over a period of two weeks. The Bible says they had given up all hope. Maybe you came in here today and you've given up all hope. But they made it. Everyone reached land safely. I want to look you in the eye today and I want to tell you this. We're going to make it. We're going to make it. You know why? Because God is our anchor. That's what Paul knew on that ship that no one else knew. You know, Paul didn't freak out like everyone else freaked out. Because he knew that he had a God who was ultimately in control. No matter what the outcome was going to be, Paul believed that God had it. When you're a Christian, you see things differently. You can look toward the future with a sense of expectation that God has a plan and God has a purpose. We build our lives on a firm foundation. But sometimes in life, there are detours. And Paul was going on a detour. In your life, you might have a detour. You might have more than one detour. You know what a detour is? It's a waiting season. You know when your GPS says rerouting? I hate that. What do you mean you're rerouting? I thought I was on the the route here. Don't reroute me, please. Sometimes in life, we get rerouted. The career change that you didn't expect, the car accident, that you didn't expect, the divorce, the infertility that has sent you in a direction you never thought you would go, the place you didn't think you were going, but you wound up there, detour. Your detour in life might be a mistake that you made, something that you did that hurt your reputation or hurt your family or hurt the people around you, Sometimes detours in life are not the dream destination. You know what I'm saying? He thought he was going to Italy, but he wound up on an island called Malta, probably a place he'd never heard of before. It was 50 miles south of Sicily and 150 miles north of Africa. Just a little island. Here's God's man. He's on this 18 miles long, this little island. We actually, a few years ago, uh, were going to Ukraine on a mission trip. And a few of you are there on that trip. I think we're still traumatized by it. So I'm going to, I'm going to talk about it to, to kind of this morning. It's, it's therapeutic for me to tell you about this. Okay? You may have heard a little bit of it before. Uh, there was a rainstorm in Pittsburgh when we were going to take off, and so the flight got delayed. But they got us on the plane, and the people on the plane said, oh, you're going to make the connection in Washington, D.C., Dulles Airport, but you're barely going to make it. And when you get there, you're going to have to run through the airport to make it. When we got there, they left me off the plane first. And I ran, guitar in one hand, bag in another hand, sprinting through the airport. I felt like an idiot. (laughs) People were like, getting out of the way. Watch out. I'm going running down through the airport. It was as far as you could get from where we got off the plane to where we had to get on the plane. And I ran this thing. And as I get there, I can see out the window that that plane is starting to back away from the gate. And I said, don't let that plane back away. Well, well, sir, the the plane's gone. No, we can't hold it up for you. Well, I have 20 people with me. 
And guess what? We've spent like $25,000 on these tickets. Yes, we've raised this money to get over on this mission trip. Stop that plane. No, sir, I can't do that. We didn't make that flight. That flight was supposed to take us to Frankfurt, Germany, and then on over to Ukraine. So where do you go now? Well, we had to go stand in line to find out for hours. When we finally got someone, they said, we're going to send you on a detour. We're going to reroute you. Instead of going to Frankfurt, you're going to Newark. Okay, well, that's a big difference. But you're going to go to Newark by van. So we stayed in the airport all night. Now we are on a detour. We're going up the New Jersey Turnpike. We thought we were going to be in Ukraine by now, but we are flying up the New Jersey Turnpike in vans. We get up to the Newark airport. They punch our tickets. They put us on an airplane for France. We're going to wind up in France. All right, we'll go through. We'll go. I don't care what it takes. Detour, reroute us. We get to France, we're stuck in that airport. And we thought, you know, we have a little bit of time. Let's run down and see the Eiffel Tower. We may never get back here. So we did. We ran down. Oh, there it is. Okay, let's go back to the airport. We just went down and just to, just to be able to say, we saw the Eiffel Tower. We get back to the airport. We are literally stuck there. They wouldn't let us get on a flight. We're stuck there overnight. Time is ticking. We've been planning this for a year, and we're not getting there. It's a detour. We finally made it. And God worked in an incredible way on that mission trip. But there are people here today in your life, you have been on some detours. You've been rerouted to places you thought you'd never go. Disappointments, compromises, diversions, detours. I taught school for a long time. And I was a high school music teacher, and I taught some kids for five or six years in a row. And I knew these kids very well, and I'm still friends with many of them. And some of these kids have done incredible things in their lives. Decorated in the military and attained advanced degrees. And what I found was that when you teach teenagers, they all have hopes. And they all have dreams about what they want to do in life. Every single one of them. But what you find is that some of those people, when they get out of school, they encounter detours in life, health issues. They don't have opportunities like other people have, and they wind up in places that they never thought that they would go. And I pray for those people. I pray for those kids. Believe me. People who are here today who are listening to my voice, you're at a place in life that you never thought you would be. And you may be wondering where you even are and where God is in it. And I'm sure that's what Paul was thinking. It says this in verse 1 of chapter 28, once safely on shore, we, that is the plural first-person pronoun. And what that shows is that Luke, the author of this book, is there with Paul. We, right, found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness, which is good news because you never know about these islanders. They could have been who knows? Are they cannibals? I mean, these people could be violent. They, they had unusual kindness. They built a fire and welcomed us all because it was raining and cold. Just picture this huge fire. You have 276 people on a boat. You have all the islanders. They have this great big, huge bonfire. You know, the monsoon is over. Thank God for these islanders. Your journey in life will not always be with the people you expected to bless you. You realize that? In fact, many times that's the case. The people you thought would be with you aren't the people ultimately who are with you. There are people who pre-COVID I thought would be with me who really are not with me. These islanders were some of those people. You know what I'm saying? People with different customs. Maybe you would call them pagans or barbarians or they're those people. The people thought, the people Paul thought would be with him turned their back on Paul. Paul's own people. In verse 17, it says this, when they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. The people he thought were his friends, not. 
They weren't. But he finds out that these islanders were. Pretty amazing. In life, we need to look for the islanders. You know what I'm saying? I want some of these islanders in my life. I I want something in a relationship where we build fires for one another. I I, I wanna look for some islanders. You know, when I first became a believer when I was 25 years old, which has been a while ago, I was so excited about my faith and I wanted to tell everybody about it and I went to relatives and I went to friends and I was telling them, hey, God's touched my life and they looked at me and they said, you you got religion? No, that's not what it's about. You know, I I just came to to know Jesus as my personal savior. Uh, Okay, all right. All right. Sometimes those people who you think you're going to get their approval will never give you their approval. But there are islanders who will be there when the chips are down. Find those people. And my prayer is that you'd find them right here in church. In fact, we're going to be coming out in the next couple weeks with all the things we're going to be doing this fall. And there's going to be a lot more opportunities in prime time on Sunday morning to connect with other people here in this church. And maybe you can find some islanders right here because there's a lot of islanders in this church. You know what I'm saying? Those people who will build a fire for you when you need it. When the world's gone crazy and the storm is raging and COVID is out of control, I need people who will build a fire for me. You know who those people have been? I mean, there have been a lot of people in this church that have been so supportive, especially over this last year. But I want to tell you, the pastors of this church have been my islanders, and I hope I've been the same for them. People who will come along beside you and speak the truth to you and encourage you in your faith. And one of those people is Trent Stubert, our new pastor here today, has been for me an absolute godsend. You need those islanders in your life. So what's he do? Paul. I mean, he's the apostle, right? He's he's the man. He gathers a pile of brushwood. This is the kind of prayer. He's out there helping them build this fire. And as he put it on the fire, a viper, driven out by heat, fastened itself on his hand. All right? So I have my viper over here. Last night, I texted the pastors, and I said, does anyone have a rubber snake? And, And the only one who had a rubber snake was Pastor Ron. Who would have guessed? He said, I have one. He sent me a picture, and here it is. So you you can imagine, and I hate snakes. Somebody said, why don't you get a live snake? I said, we're not doing those kind of services here, right, you know, with the snakes. That's not us. But but we'll do a rubber snake, all right? And and we brought this snake, and, and, and I was thinking, what would Paul be thinking? God, really? I just made it through the hurricane, survived, And now a snake has bit me? What? I'm I'm your man. I'm here trying to serve you. I could be back in Jerusalem. I had a life. And now I have this? You know, my grandmother lived next door to me growing up. She was from a different generation. She had snakes. And we actually, my grandmother had half a basement. I don't know if anyone else in the world ever had half a basement. But the other half of the basement, you could get to it if you crawled through a hole. And it brought you up underneath part of my grandmother's house. It was a real small crawl space, but there was light in there. There was like a window on the side. And in that crawl space, kids from my neighborhood would go and dig in the dirt. And you could hear grandma walking around upstairs. She didn't even know we were down there. Be quiet. I don't want my grandmother to kick us out. We'd dig around in the dirt. But the thing you had to do before you went up in that crawl space, you had to go make sure there's no snakes up in that crawl space. Because sometimes there was snakes. You'd see them hanging from the rafters in that crawl space. And sometimes, this is going to show you how redneck my family is, and I'm sorry. Sometimes those snakes would get up in that house And my grandmother, I remember one time, I was probably, I don't know, elementary school. My brother was a teenager. And my grandma called and said, we got a snake in the house. Can you come and get it out? And my dad was working or something. My brother goes down there. 
And this snake is hanging from the top of a doorway. And it's dangling. It's a huge snake. And I remember him. Now he probably watched this video today, and I don't want to embarrass him. And he may not even remember this, but he had like a 10-foot pole, you know. And he's, I can remember his body was shaking, <laughs> trying to get this big snake. It's hanging down. This snake was huge. And he finally got it down, and he got it out the door, and he was like the hero. My grandmother was so happy. You got the snake out of my house, you know. Listen, sometimes in life, we can get bit. And it's probably not going to be by a snake. In fact, I hope you don't get bit by a snake. And incidentally, sometimes we have snakes in this church because we're by the woods and people leave a door open. And, and there's occasionally, once in a while, been snakes in here. And Pastor Greg is the guy we call on to get the snakes out. For whatever reason, the man has no fear of snakes and he doesn't care if they bite him. He just picks them up and relocates them back into the wild. That is not me. I don't want to get bit. And sometimes in life we get bit. And when Paul gets bit by this snake, it's very public. Everybody's standing there watching him. Here's the man of God. How's he going to respond? You know, it's one thing when you get bit and it's private and no one sees it. But it's another thing when everyone sees it. And they see how you as a Christian really react when you get bit. When you get bit, people are looking to see how you react and if you really do trust God. Verse 4, when the islanders saw the snake hanging from his hand, they said to each other, now here comes the talk. Here comes the gossip. This man must be a murderer. I mean, that's a, that's a brilliant thought. He got bit by a snake. Yeah, he must be a murderer. For though he escaped from the sea, the goddess Justice, this is their Greek mythology, their pagan religion, has not allowed him to live. And so... The gossip begins because the Christian got bit. And where was his God? And he must be a bad guy. And he must be a murderer. You know those people that gossip with you? They will gossip about you. That's from Instagram. That's not from the Bible. <laughs> people are going to talk. You know, they're going to make assumptions. They're going to jump to conclusions. Did you hear what happened with so-and-so? Did you hear the power of words? And they start talking about Paul. I think he's a murderer, right? The power of words. You know, words speak life. And sometimes words can speak harm and death. There are people here, you remember harsh words from when you were a kid. You remember what that coach said to you that beat you down. You remember what the coach said to you that built you up. You remember what that bully said to you. You might have even remembered what your pastor said to you at one point that hurt you. Words. They start talking. You know, they hurled insults at Jesus, too. Do you know that? People will hurt you. Sometimes they don't even mean to. This is the most godly person on the planet. When I was getting ready to take over this church as the pastor, I don't know if take over is a good word. It's God's church, not mine. There was someone who said, you know, I think we need to look for someone else. That's hard to take. It's hard. How will you react when someone says something about you? You know, I can't control anyone else, and I'm not claiming to be perfect, and I've probably said things along the way somewhere that may have hurt people, but I will tell you, I want God to use my words. First Peter 2.15, by doing good, put to silence ignorant, foolish people. Can I say that one more time? By doing good, put to silence ignorant, foolish people. Because he was bitten by a snake. And people are saying ugly, untrue things about him. And what does he do? Verse 5, but Paul shook the snake off. He shook it off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. He didn't throw a fit. He didn't get on Twitter or Facebook and start complaining. He didn't get filled with venom. You know what I'm saying? He didn't get filled with a venom of bitterness or anger or resentment. There comes a time in life, sometimes we got to shake it off and make a decision. I'm going to trust God. Just shaking it off. 
Why would this happen? Why would you get bit in life? Why would Paul get bit by a snake? I want to tell you an even more important question. It's not why would it happen, but what is your response going to be? The people just stood back and watched. What's he going to do? Verse 6, the people expected him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. But after waiting a long time and seeing nothing unusual to happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. It's amazing how people change their opinions so quickly, isn't it? He goes from being a murderer to a god. They watched. They thought he was going to die. There are some people that thought you were going to quit. There are some people that thought you were going to throw in the towel. There are some people that thought you were going to give up. You may have walked in here today. You may have thought you were going to give up. There are some people who waited for you to fall apart. But what they did not see was that there was a God working behind the scenes. An infinite, loving God. Was he on a detour? Yes. Was he shipwrecked? Yes. Was he bit? Yes. But God was working. And I want to tell you today, in your life, God is working. And I don't know what detour you're on, but Paul had a choice and we have a choice. We could either choose misery and wallow in it and have a pity party and give up and go back to Israel, throw in the towel or to go on a mission. Because the greatest opportunities I believe in the Christian faith come from standing strong in adversity. Let me say that one more time. The greatest opportunities come from standing strong in adversity. And right there in front of everyone, he just shakes it off. And the people said, this guy is something special. He's something different. And so the leadership wants to meet this guy. This guy who didn't die, Look at verse 7. There was an estate nearby that belonged to Publius, the chief official of the island. He welcomed us to his home and showed us generous hospitality for three days. Paul stood strong in adversity, and here comes the opportunity now. He could have missed it. He could have turned back. He could have given up. But here comes the opportunity. And it has to do with this guy's family. Praying for his family. Verse 8, his father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. And I'm sure they did everything they could do to try to heal this guy. Paul went in to see him. And after prayer, just picture this, he places his hands on him and he heals this person. You will notice when Paul goes in there, he doesn't lead with judgment. He doesn't say, listen, Publius, you're going to have to change your ways here because you're worshiping false gods and you can't do that. If you want to be with me, you want to be in my church, you got to do it my way, my morality. He doesn't lead with that. I'm sure those changes came. But what he leads with is the truth about God's love and his power at work in the life of a person. And he touches this guy. And by the power of Jesus... He's healed. And God says, listen, I'll use your shipwreck. I'll use your disappointment. I'll use your snake bite. I'll use your Malta to bring about something amazing. Our God works together, all things together for the good, right? Romans 8. Of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Verse 9, when this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. There's a revival going on because one person was willing. One unimpressive person who knew a very impressive God. They all came. And they honored us in many ways. And when we were ready to sail, they furnished us with the supplies we needed. So powerful. What an opportunity. Our greatest opportunities come on the heels of adversity. And wherever you are right now, I want to tell you that God is working. I never wanted to be on Malta, but we've all been on Malta in our lives somewhere. 
But when you're there, I want you to ask yourself these questions today. If you came in here today and you feel like you're on a detour, and I'm sure there are many people listening to my voice that are, who can I heal? Who can I pray for? I may be on a detour, but who can I pray for? Who can I love? Who can I encourage? Even though I've been bit, even though I've been shipwrecked, whose life can I touch? And tell them about Jesus. Listen, if you're praying today for a family member, Here's a challenge. It's for me and everyone here. If you're praying today for a family member, you become the answer to that prayer. You become the answer to that prayer. You put feet to that prayer. For that family member who needs someone to come along beside them because they're battling cancer, you become that person. To that family member who is far from God, you become the messenger of God. You become the Apostle Paul to that person. You ask them how you can pray for them. You're a person of God, right? You become the answer to the prayers of the people in your own family. And just see what God begins to do, not only in your family, but what God begins to do in you. It was one unimpressive person, but one willing person. And it changed everything. Amen? Let me pray for us. And God, we want to be that person in our lives, in our families, in our detours, in our shipwrecks, in our snake bites, God, in our lives, wherever it might be, in the workplace, on the college campus, with our team, in the classroom, with our own children, God, we want to be the people that you use to minister this kind of hope. So I pray today you would inspire us, use us. Help us to be a people who are completely yielded to you. God, I want what you want. God, we want what you want. And I pray that we would not be distracted, that we would keep our eyes on you, the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. That the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, that that name may be exalted in our lives and in our community. In his name we pray. Amen. And amen.